I grew up in the city of Peterborough, uh, where I met my first so-called visible minority individual at the age of 12, when my family hosted a black African, uh, black Anglican bishop from Uganda in Canada for the Anglican Congress. The only person with an accent that I knew uh, was a German family who was our backdoor neighbor. I'm told, but I can't confirm, that Peterborough had had a law that did not permit black people to live within its city boundaries until the early 1900s. In our community in those days, indigenous people were referred to as Indians, sometimes called savages, and did not usually fare well in the cowboy and Indian TV shows of the 1950s and 60s. Our local church took great pride in gathering bales to be sent to boys and girls uh, in, this, in the state-operated church-run residential schools. Even a cursory glance at the history of federal le legislation concerning First Nations people reveals some startling systemic racism. In the 1920s, uh, there were signs on public beaches in Toronto, no Jews or dogs allowed. People from Poland, Ukraine, China, Japan, Newfoundland, Pakistan, actually anyone that was different from the minority group, including Roman Catholics, were referred to by derogatory names. We've come a long way in Canada since then. Or have we? Black and Indigenous persons are jailed in Canada at a rate far exceeding the percentage of population. Boardrooms show a remarkable lack of diversity. Entire Indigenous communities are under boil water orders and have been for years and live in substandard housing. Racialized people report racist incidents and the majority culture says, nah, it's not so. I acknowledge as much as I wish that it were not so that I still bear in my own life vestiges of that racism all these decades later in my own life. The recent efforts of the Black Lives Matter and Black Indigenous Persons of Color movement, punctuated by the police response to the Black Lives Matter protest in November, as opposed to the white persons storming of the Capitol last week, has only placed this issue solidly in front of the national discourse. As Christians, we believe that every person is created in the image of God, that each person is given breath by the Creator God. We are to look into the face of others and see the face of God. So what are we Christians to make about this notion of systemic racism? We are honored to have this evening in our midst a distinguished follower of Jesus Christ to lead us in this first discussion to help us uncover layers of systemic racism. I could take the balance of the time this evening just introducing Mark McDonald. Let me give a few highlights of his extraordinary life. Now, uh, Mark, I don't normally comment on when someone was born, but since tomorrow is Mark's birthday, happy birthday, Mark. Mark holds a BA in Religious Studies and Psychology, a Master's in Divinity, did postgraduate work at Luther Northwestern Theological Seminary in Minnesota, and holds a Doctor of Divinity from Wycliffe College in Toronto. When you take a peek at his life as a pastor, you'll see that he's had a varied ministry in Canada and the United States, Mississauga, uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Portland, Oregon, and the Southeast Regional Mission of uh, the Diocese of um, Nahovaland. Um, prior to his ordination in the, to the Episcopate, Archbishop McDonald was canon missioner for training in the Diocese of, Min of Minnesota and vicar of St. Antipas Church in Redby, Min Minnesota, and St. John's in the Wilderness Church in Red Lake, Red Lake Nation, Minnesota. Mark served as uh, Bishop of Alaska from 1997 to 2007. And in 2006, he was announced that he had been appointed the assistant bishop of Navajo area, a Navajo land area mission and was affirmed in that appointment in 2007. Mark became the first ever national indigenous bishop, now archbishop in the Anglican Church of Canada, overseeing indigenous ministry from coast to coast to coast. Mark was awarded the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal in recognition of his spiritual leadership while serving Aboriginal communities and his contribution to environmental awareness in Canada. He has been uh, the World Council of Churches President in North America since 2013. Mark is classified as a non-status Indian in Canada, even though both his parents have Indigenous ancestry. 
Mark is an honored and respected elder in the indigenous community for his spiritual leadership and for his unique authentic ability to help settlers and indigenous understand one another. Mark is an internationally sought after speaker, an author, a passionate disciple of Jesus Christ, a lover of the Bible, a staunch advocate for self-governing Indigenous Church within the Anglican Church of Canada. His humor, his humility, his intellect and Christian faith and love of Jesus will be so evident to each of you this night. Mark will speak for a period of time, and then that will be followed by an opportunity for questions and answers. Uh, it'll be difficult with 70 so people on the call, but we'll do our best to try to sort that out. And then we will conclude with a period of, of prayer, which Mark will lead. So please give a warm Trinity Zoom welcome to my dear friend, colleague, and tomorrow's birthday boy, the most reverend Dr. Mark <laughs> McDonald. Welcome, Mark. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's that's pretty it's pretty snazzy. Um, <laughs> thank you, Philip. Uh, that's that's uh, I I think I think I'll I'll listen to myself more tonight than than I usually do. That's good. That's good. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> uh, thank you, every everybody. Uh, and uh, I, I'm delighted to be here and. Uh, more than uh, happy to be able to speak about this topic and especially to speak about it in the moment we are in, uh, uh, in this time uh, in history and in creation. Uh, we uh, are in a, a, a time of revelation, uh, a time of uh, unveiling of, of, of truth. Uh, that uh, I think has happened uh, because of the pandemic and also uh, uh, also because of the uh, uh, the uh, execution of uh, George Floyd in the midst of the pandemic. Uh, I think this has uh, uh, unveiled all sorts of brutalities that um, uh, people have have, have tolerated uh, and have gone unseen uh, and and not just you know not just by the people who uh, uh, have perpetrated those things uh, uh, I I often go to Prince Albert and uh, I will I will go out with uh, Cree friends uh, to eat at uh, restaurants and uh, they get treated just miserably, just miserably. Uh, we will walk in and uh, 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 white people will come in and be uh, after them and they will be waited on. Uh, you know, uh, they'll ignore uh, the, the group I'm with. Uh, they'll ignore them and see all the white people first and then finally this group uh, that I'm with will be seated. And uh, uh, White folks will will be waited on before everybody, and uh, the Cree people will will sit there happily and not notice this awful, awful, awful treatment, and uh, and they will. Uh, it's it's just become so much a part of the fabric of of their existence that they they just they just don't notice that treatment. And uh, Bishop Michael Hawkins, who is a uh, uh, not indigenous, uh, uh, he comments about it too. Uh, 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 when, as I said, when I when I go there because I'm not from there, it's something that I notice. And I think what's happened is not just the people who, who uh, perpetrate or benefit from the way things are, it's also the people who are the victims of, of the way things are. Um, um, th th we are in a moment when uh, uh, the, the systems of, of oppression and prejudice uh, have been revealed in a way that we haven't seen before. And I, th I think it's a, a time uh, when we may see uh, a great change. The vulnerabilities and brutalities that uh, have been built into the fabric of our collective life 
uh, are, are being seen in ways that we've never been seen before. And I think that we have a, a, a great opportunity and uh, I, I, I hope that, I, I would say, I would argue and I hope you will see what I am arguing uh, after I talk, that we have a prophetic opportunity uh, before us that is uh, really astonishing. <clears throat> and certainly unlike anything I've seen in my life. So um, systemic racism. Uh, now I, I listen carefully to people and I certainly noticed this before uh, I, I heard the person I'm going to quote, uh, uh, but uh, uh, I, uh, the, I had a, a, a great moment of revelation when that great, uh, great scholar of the English language uh, s said, uh, 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 s quoted uh, the, the term s uh, systemic racism, uh, th that great uh, um, uh, observer of, of, of the English language, Donald Trump. Uh, when uh, it was, it was when he uh, t he used systemic racism. It was very clear that what he meant is really, really bad racism, and and uh, so uh, uh, it was. It, and, and I'm saying that it was very clear that he didn't understand at all what systemic racism. Is. When a lot of people use the term systemic racism, they're actually, and this was clear that Trump was using it, is that uh, what they mean is that there are a lot of people who are really uh, grossly uh, 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 uncouth in the way they express uh, their uh, racism towards other people. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it, 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 they, they really, really don't understand what it means, uh, systemic racism. And uh, uh, they, they mean that uh, they, they understand systemic racism to mean that there are a lot of people around who uh, express uh, outwardly, a, a kind of a gross, uh, uh, a gross uh, anti, uh, 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 usually anti black uh, 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 language and, and, and uh, 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 expressions. Anyway, so uh, <laughs> uh, it's, it's important to realize that the uh, Ku Klux Klan, uh, they claim not to be racist, you know. Now, if they don't want to be called racist, nobody wants to be called racist. Uh, the, 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 the term racist uh, has become so repugnant that there's absolutely nobody in uh, North American society who wants it. Uh, it, it, it. It has basically uh, Become a code word for white trash. It it uh, uh, it it, uh, it 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 and uh, so when you say systemic racism, uh, most people interpret it as uh, meaning that there are a whole bunch of people who are uh, uh, uncouth and nasty, and uh, and. Uh, and they, they simply don't understand what it means. In fact, uh, there's two parts to systemic racism that are important to understand. That um, one part is that there's built into society a, a whole bunch of of ideas and assumptions that are well hidden uh, from, from uh, uh, people's point of view. Uh, they are assumptions that uh, have 
been there for many, 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 many centuries, for instance. Uh, uh, so, for instance, um, the, the idea that uh, the Americas were discovered, this, uh, you know, if, if, if you were stopped on the street and somebody said, who discovered America? Well, you know, uh, you would say Columbus, probably. Uh, the question has a built-in assumption that, uh, you know, to tell you the truth, even, you know, slap my hand, uh, even if I was asked it, I'd probably say Columbus. But uh, actually, no, I grew up in Minnesota. I'd probably say Leif Erikson, slap my hand again. So uh, uh, it, it's, it's, these things are so built into the way uh, uh, people who, are, who were raised in North America, that even the question uh, it, it has an assumption tied to it that is uh, it, that it is a false premise, and uh, uh, it, it's it, it's an idea that the people who lived in the Americas were so primitive that they were barely human, and uh, the the idea of discovery. Uh, uh, is based on the idea that the people who lived in in this uh, in the Americas were uh, uh, like uh, like the animals, like like the plants, like uh, uh, and 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 and, the, and in the literature of that time, they described them, uh, and the people at that time thought it was the best thing that could be done. Uh, for these poor, miserable people, uh, is, is to uh, 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 whatever way possible, by force or whatever way possible, uh, to uh, take them out of their miserable state and, uh, and make them uh, make them uh, join uh, civilization. Uh, today is very different. So, for instance. Uh, uh, we know that the idea of, of uh, uh, constitutional democracy uh, was was discovered by the people of six nations, and not by not by uh, not by um, other people. The ancient idea of, of what we would call constitutional democracy uh, was borrowed from six nations. There's a very strong argument for for that. At the very least, we can say they had it before they came into contact uh, with other people. We know that there were a number of very sophisticated ideas, that there were some areas of pharmacology that were present in the Americas that were advanced in terms of what was available uh, in, in, uh, in, in, the, in Europe. Uh, there were uh, areas of astrology the same thing could be said for parts of Africa. Uh, uh, we now know that uh, there were arguments that were used to justify the enslavement of African people, and that these arguments were uh, built into uh, the, the uh, assumptions that, uh, uh, that uh, people have. So these things are centuries old that were built into uh, uh, very subtle uh, ideas that are so deeply entwined into uh, the way uh, 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 the way uh, ideas have developed over time in uh, in uh, 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 the dominant culture. Uh, that's what we're talking about when we speak of systemic racism. Now, it isn't, it isn't uh, uh, gross, it's very polite. It's, there's nothing nasty about it at all. And, uh, and uh, it, is, uh, uh, it is very difficult because it's so ingrained that uh, 
even indigenous people, uh, even um, 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 African descent, descended people uh, who come, grow up in this environment, um, they too can uh, 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 inhabit these ideas and these ways of thinking. Uh, certainly, it's a problem for indigenous people. Um, and as I said, as in the example I gave for Prince, from Prince Albert, uh, uh, this is uh, this is something that happens. And we know uh, that at a very early age, uh, people this happens. So I had an um, African American family that was part of my parish in uh, Portland, Oregon, and um, they had a young boy who was five years old. And they lived in a, a community in, a, in an area that was uh, largely uh, white families. And they were driving into the area and there was a, a program where they had a crime watch. Uh, uh, everybody in the area was to look out for uh, 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 people who were uh, uh, strange to the area. Anyway, but the, the crime watch uh, uh, person was a cloaked figure with a hat on and wearing a black uh, uh, a black uh, uh, coat. And the, as they drove by, uh, the five girls who couldn't read uh, said, "Mom, what's that?" And she said, "Well, that's to uh, that's to uh, help us uh, keep out uh, bad people." And, and he said to her, mom, is that because we live here? And, and, uh, and, and she, she said it broke her heart that already he had internalized uh, the prejudice uh, that, that uh, the larger society had towards a person of color. And uh, I can tell you, uh, young uh, indigenous people go through the same sort of thing, and even though they they might be uh, they might be told by their parents proud things about their culture and people, it it is almost as if there's something in the water that uh, that helps them to internalize negative images about who they are and what they are. This is. What, what systemic racism is about. And it's very subtle, it's very pervasive, it's ubiquitous. And, uh, and this is really what we're talking about. And it infects the people it victimizes in the same way it infects the people who benefit from it. And this is one of the most important things uh, to, to understand about systemic racism. Um, now, there are other aspects of it. Uh, and, and here I want to turn to a biblical understanding of it. There is a word in Galatians 3 that is important. Um, uh, Paul says, he asks the question, who has beguiled you? <laughs> Sometimes translated, who has bewitched you? And the, the New Testament speaks a lot about what we call systemic evil. It usually speaks about it in the terms principalities and powers. It's usually speaking about it in terms of, of idolatry. And uh, it's, it's the way in which uh, human beings as communities bec become corrupted. Now, oftentimes, we, we in our society look at the way individuals are corrupted. But um, the Old Testament, and Paul, indeed, in Galatians 3, is interested how we as a people as a whole become corrupted. And uh, this, is, this is what systemic racism is about, is how um, 
uh, evil becomes hidden in a whole group. Uh, now, um, racism, as for a long time, has been uh, uh, the focus has been on individuals. So, how does one person become uh, grossly uh, prejudiced? And that is an important thing, but. Um, especially in the George Floyd era, we have become, and the happenings on, in the Capitol on Epiphany, uh, January 6th, has helped. You know, how did those very smart police, how did they get tricked into treating these people who obviously Obviously, I mean, they said they were out to do bad. How did they get a, a trick into treating them with kid gloves when the Black Lives Matter people who were peaceful in, in that era were treated with tear gas and, and uh, rubber bullets? It, it, you know, I mean, it, on the first surface of it, it was astonishing, you know. Uh, this is a People are beginning to see what Paul is speaking about in Galatians 3. Uh, Paul, if Paul was here, he would say, who beguiled you to the Capitol Police? You know, who, who tricked you? Um, and uh, this is uh, the way in which um, a group of people uh, can be lulled into a way of thinking so that they fear one group of people uh, because they feel they're foreign and dangerous and trust another group of people because they identify with them or feel that they, you know, well, they look like me, they feel like me, they, uh, uh, they react like me, uh, they're okay. Um, so uh, now I want, to, I want to delve into this a little bit further. Uh, Christian commentators have not looked at this as much as the rabbis have. And so I've looked at this very carefully. The rabbis were very interested in this because uh, they, uh, um, they pointed out, uh, so uh, for instance, they, they, uh, uh, they said in the, in the issue of the uh, uh, golden, uh, the making of the, 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 the golden calf. They pointed out that uh, human beings uh, are capable of doing something that is so, uh, really, really gross <laughs> when they do it together. <laughs> so uh, you know, what the, what the rabbis are trying to say is, you know, an individual is not going to go out and make a golden calf. But as a group, they could make a golden calf. It, it's, it's uh, you know, they, that, they're trying to point out the, 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 the power of systemic evil. That, um, uh, you know, an individual like, and let's pick on, let's keep picking on the Americans, you know, uh, they're easy to target. Um, it, uh, it might not be easy for a, an individual to build a statue of a Confederate uh, a general, but it is easy for a group to do it. Uh, it's, it's, it's these sorts of things that uh, the rabbis are, are trying to point out that uh, we have a power together to do evil that is beyond the power of individuals. And we have to watch out for that. We have to watch out for that. Um, uh, now, th th that's one aspect of the systemic evil. But um, they, there's another aspect of systemic evil, and that is the more subtle aspect of it. That um, uh, it, 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 it's, 
it's what I was talking about when I, I said we uh, is this kind of built-in evil, this kind of uh, uh, you know uh, this subtle uh, so like using the term discover um, it, it, it it's it's so subtle that um, you know so so that uh, even the national indigenous Anglican Archbishop uses it. It's it's uh, it, it's uh, it's this this is it's a very hurtful and harmful idea, um, and and uh, it it it, uh, it is built into the way that we think, and we, we it's an idea that we must overcome. So um, systemic the idea of systemic racism is an idea that is implicit in, uh, 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 it, it's, it's not directly, uh, in, uh, directly implicit in uh, scripture uh, because uh, racism is, is a, a new permu permutation of the idolatry and the a systemic evil that scripture addresses so clearly and directly. Uh, but uh, it, it, it is an idea that we can see is certainly the primary concern of biblical truth. Um, it, you know, so it's not an idea that somebody cooked up uh, you know, a, a couple of years ago uh, it is a way in which people have tried to express a reality that is as old as as Adam and Eve. Uh, it is it is uh, the uncomfortable reality of the way human beings, um, as a collective, uh, can act in an evil way. And and hurt people as a collective, and uh, but I would say this: um, um, there are two things that, um, that 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 we must say about the triumph over systemic racism and systemic evil, in in uh, in Colossians. 2 verse 15, it says that uh, the principalities and powers were disabled by Jesus Christ on the cross. And that the, the power of the cross, the message of the cross, um, the good news of the cross is, uh, is, is something that uh, 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 rips apart the power of these uh, these systems of evil, and I think that it's saying that those of us who are Christian uh, have a unique mission to try to disable and disarm uh, these and unmask. I think uh, these systems that beguile. Uh, the, the the nations and the peoples, and uh, I would also say uh, that uh, the Paul's teaching on reconciliation, especially what we find in Ephesians, where he talks about the reconciliation, well, the, the Ephesians, and also in Corinthians, where he, you know, he talks about the reconciliation. That Christ has done on the cross; those two things, the, dis, dis, the disabling of of the e evil principalities and powers, and also the reconciliation that uh, Christ has done between those who have a, a, a enmity between each other; uh, those two things, I think, are uh, God's uh, uh, answer. Uh, to to systemic racism and um, you know I think it, it, it's so urgent for for us. Uh, uh, I 
I get to, you know, I get to visit. But, you know, when I was when I started out as the National Indigenous Bishop, uh, I, you know, I would go to a community and I would get two things. You know, the, when the prime minister would visit, I, would, you know, I would say to Fred, "When you go there, they bring you to the mayor." You know, when, when I go there, they bring me two places. They bring me to the cemetery that used where uh, at the, where they used to have the residential school. And then they bring me to the prison, you know? So, and uh, so uh, they would bring me to the cemetery where all the kids who died in the residential school were put. And, you know, you ask the question, you know, what kind of school has a cemetery, you know? And then the second thing is the, the jails have so many indigenous people. Uh, that isn't right that our jails are filled with indigenous people. But it's very clear that a part of the problem is the misery that these people live in, but a big part of it is the fear that our, uh, the fear that our uh, uh, um, justice system has of these, of these men. And uh, so we must, we must uh, pull apart uh, these uh, these systems uh, uh, that have er erected, and I think uh, the the best guide that we have is to relearn the the scripture and the things that it teaches about systemic evil. And I probably talk, goodness gracious, I have definitely talked too long, but I hope we have some time for your questions and comments. Thank you for your patience. I didn't see anybody sleeping, so yeah. Yeah. that's terrific, Mark. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. I think there are two ways we can try to do questions and answers, and Mark would be quite happy to take them. Uh, one is yeah. if you go to the bottom of the screen, you'll see where it says on your computer it says chat. And if you hit that button, try to find where it says everyone, and you can ask a question there. And Natalie and I will monitor those and we'll just ask them of Mark. Um, the other thing that we can try to do um, is uh, to either signal me or unmute yourself and um, um, boldly go where no person dares to go and, and uh, just blurt out the question. And I'll do my best to look at the, um, uh, the screens and see whether we can um, pick up those questions. So if anyone does have a question or a comment, I know Mark would be uh, would be delighted to receive them and respond to them. You bet, you bet, you bet. Uh, could I ask why you're a non-status uh, um, Indian or indigenous or what uh, what happened there? But, um, so first of all, my uh, uh, my my uh, the primary uh, my, my my the primary indigenous uh, 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 um, my primary indigenous background is Wyandotte from uh, uh, from Oklahoma and uh, and the, uh, uh, I I I could probably receive status if I worked at, at that. Um, but they, that would not give me status here. And, uh, uh, and but but and I'm not particularly interested in it um, for a number of reasons. Um, I think that the the status system is is not good. Uh, and I, I think it's worthwhile to say under this that the status system is a part of systemic racism too. Uh, the status system, if, if the status system, uh, the status system is, is based, uh, is premised on the idea that eventually indigenous people will exist no more. And the status system, uh, under the status system, eventually there will not be any more status Indians. Uh, 
even though there will still be indigenous people all over the place, but uh, it, just like in the United States, uh, the, uh, to have status under the American system is based on blood quantum. Uh, eventually, uh, uh, the, uh, in order to have enough blood quantum, uh, you're, you're either going to have to, uh, you're, you, you'll have a choice. Uh, you can either not be a member of your tribe or you will have to face a, a kind of a, a, a genetic Russian roulette um, marrying someone who is a close relative. So eventually under the, their system, uh, they won't exist either. So at some point in time, they're going to have to follow the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People and let Indigenous people determine their own uh, way of, of, of existence. So, you know, so I'm not, you know, I'm, but I'm, I'm, I'm happier to have Indigenous people recognize me as Indigenous than the Canadian government recognize me as Indigenous. So that's, that, that's basically it. So I hope that I hope that made sense. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Mark, I've had a couple of yeah. um, I've had a couple of questions being asked on the chat <clears throat> chat line. So let me. Um, sure. um, uh, uh, the first sure. one is: What can ordinary church members best do to support our sisters and our indigenous sisters and brothers? I think there's a couple of things um, that are important. I think, um, you know, what's really, what's really good is uh, to, um, uh, you know, develop as much relationships with uh, indigenous uh, people in your, your areas. Now, uh, you know, there are a lot of, you know, Toronto is arguably uh, the second largest indigenous city in North America. Uh, uh, people don't think of it that way, but Toronto is so big that uh, they kind of they disappear in it. Eh? So, uh, but there's a lot of indigenous stuff that goes on in Toronto and people can relate to that. And I, I think, you know, indigenous people are very relational. And uh, if you can learn about stuff, uh, that is uh, uh, that is you know that is important. Uh, by the way, I just say you know as a as a footnote, uh, Wyandot, uh, you know my my grand grandfather was Wyandot. Uh, they used to live around here, so I like to think of myself as uh, an advanced party reclaiming Toronto for the for uh, for our tribe. Anyway, so so uh, but. Uh, uh, Getting back to what you said, which is a beautiful question, um, is, is I, you know, I, I think, it, you know, there are issues of great concern for this area. You know, if you could get to know a little bit and, you know, maybe it is impossible for you to, you know, um, get directly related, but you can get indirectly related and, and uh, maybe see what's of concern to people in the area. And um, and, uh, and and maybe uh, you know get involved in it on the, on that on that level, uh, you know maybe find out what's uh, uh, you know maybe just Google what's what's what indigenous events are going on in Toronto or uh, find out which indigenous restaurants have opened up you know after the pandemic but or maybe before the pandemic and have them. Uh, and deliver them to you, you know. So uh, that's what I would do, you know. Support indigenous bishops and that, um, uh, do, do, you know, that sort of stuff. I, th I think, uh, to me, uh, uh, that's really important. The last thing that I would say is, um, if you let your politicians know that this matters to you, that 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 means like the world because they're not getting the mis the message that this matters to people and i how do i know that because they never talk about it <laughs> the election comes up and 
you know, I mean, every once in a while they say, well, you know, yeah, I mean, we care about indigenous people, but then they never do anything. So uh, I think they need to hear from you folks that this matters. And I think if 10 people told them, you know what I really care about? I really care about indigenous people. I, I think if they heard from 10 people, that could that could change their minds. So so just those things would really, 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 really help. And also um, the mentor, my mentor, who recruited me and got me involved in this on, on a church level, uh, she said to me, she was convinced that the church was the, could be the most important and critical advocate on church issues of any organization and institution in North American society. And I think that's true. Yeah. So thank you for that question. It's a beautiful question. Yeah. Yeah. Mark, um, another question in the chat um, link um, is, uh, in, Kathy said, um, I liked your reference to Col Colossians 2.15 about the role we have as Christians to break down the powers of systemic evil. Can you speak a bit more about yes. that? Yes, um, that's, that's good. So, um, uh, what I think uh, people don't really have a clear understanding. We need to talk about it. Uh, uh, very a lot more uh, what uh, Paul speaks about as principalities, powers, authorities, uh, those things. We, um, uh, I use four terms. Um, I, 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 there was a, a, a theologian who helped me understand them, but uh, 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 what we call ideologies, institutions, images, and identities. Um, these four things are what uh, in the ancient world, uh, they called principalities, powers, and authorities. And uh, these things are uh, very, um, very, very powerful in um, uh, controlling uh, human beings and ordering uh, human beings' lives. And uh, uh, a lot of these things are now operating through uh, technology, you know, um, through social media and those sorts of things. And I think uh, human beings are becoming more and more enslaved uh, by these things and are becoming discipled by them. And I think that it is very, very important for us uh, to raise the issue of um, God's sovereignty over human beings and over other uh, institutions uh, uh, and, uh, and and I think to remind everybody that um, Christ definit definitively uh, uh, the destroyed that sovereignty, <laughs> um, uh, the, the sovereignty of those things on the cross and uh, demonstrated God's sovereignty. <clears throat> I think that um, uh, he, uh, he showed that um, uh, that uh, power now now that God's power does not reside in those things that are shiny and fearsome and um, um, uh, uh, you know the, the 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 great and glorious from a human point of view, but uh, in in the weak and the uh, um, the the marginal and that sort of thing. I think uh, we are in in, in a, t a period that has been beguiled by uh, institutions, ideologies, images, 
and those sorts of things. And I think um, uh, we, uh, I think that uh, our task really is to reassert that victory of Christ. And, uh, and, and I'm really trying to think it through for, for myself as well, uh, because you know I, I'm 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 beginning to feel that I too have, and I'm not I'm not certainly not uh, uh, putting myself forward as the, a grand victor in this battle, uh, but but as as someone who is suddenly uh, feeling also uh, the call in the midst of of of, of defeat uh, to 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 move forward. I think that uh, we must uh, be in, engaged. Now, uh, let me read something that I read today uh, uh, from uh, St. Francis. I hope you won't mind me taking an extra minute to answer this. So, uh, so uh, uh, those who heard the Blessed Francis and Brother Giles would say, who are these men? And what are these words they're saying? For at that time, love and fear of God were non-existent almost everywhere. And the way of penance was not only completely unknown, but it was also considered folly. Lust for the flesh, greed for the world, and pride of life was so widespread that the whole world seemed to be engulfed in these three malignancies. Well, I guess that's what, what I'm saying. And I think that uh, uh, the victory of Christ, uh, which we experience, um, I think, in uh, um, uh, experience in the power of love, in the patient endurance, in the experience of the Eucharist, in the experience of Christ in our midst, uh, these things uh, have to be our focus uh, uh, in the face of <laughs> in the tsunami of the principalities and powers of life. I'm sorry for such a long answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your Grace, I'm feeling as though I'm not even giving you a chance to take a breath here. So um, no, 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 no. I'll ask. I, I, I'll ask my question I, slowly. <laughs> uh, this one's. Uh, uh, interesting to me for lots of reasons. Um, Anne asks, um, how helpful are the acknowledgements of being on indigenous territories that have been um, starting at the beginning of uh, film festivals and et cetera in the last few years? Do they accomplish anything concrete or are they simply lip service and virtual signaling? Uh, well, that's a good question. So um, I have a, I, 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 I was uh, I was uh, I, my uh, a woman who adopted me a number of years ago. Um, let's see, thirty years ago she adopted me. She she's a Cinnaboyan Sioux, and she adopted me. She said, "You're my brother," and I I was so proud I, that she was my sister. And a, a couple of weeks later, she borrowed my car and drove it to Montana. Anyway, so so that, uh, what I'm using that that uh, example for is that the acknowledgments are beautiful, but we have to also understand that there's a reality that underlies it. Underlies it, you know that um, that. Uh, I th I I think it's a it's a very beautiful question because I think that um, I think they're good like so I got to watch uh, uh, Stephen Harper's uh, apology today you know and some people say it's you know it was not just lip service and I sat next to an elder when the apology was given I was present. And the elder had a physical reaction to the apology, you know. And um, so the acknowledgement is not a bad thing, even when it is just 
words, you know. But I think what what it's a call to the people who use those words to follow through on reality, you know. It, it so um, I, I think um, uh, I I would link the words of the apology to the question, earlier question about what are the best things that we can do, you know. So I think we should link the apology to trying to build a relationship. Now, I, I think we need to be careful and I would say uh, 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 gentle to ourselves in building that relationship, you know, uh, because uh, 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 when, when we, you know, we have had kind of an open house policy uh, to people, uh, indigenous style, wherever we've lived, most of our ministry. And, uh, you know, you know we ha we've always had a lot of people eating over and, you know, that's, you know, that's, indigenous style, we do it that way. But but when we moved to Toronto, <laughs> I, uh, we had a, I came home and Virginia was feeding a bunch of folks. And I said, I said, sweetheart, we're in Toronto, you know? And unless you want to do this full time, you better, <laughs> you better be careful, you know? I said, it can't be the way we did it in Fairbanks and, and uh, Bemidji and so on. So, so I think, you know, I, I'm not asking you to 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 do it full time. I'm just saying, uh, do it gentle, in a way that doesn't, uh, you know, um, you know, Paul, uh, Paul always said, you know, don't 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 kill yourself, you know, uh, but. Uh, you know, try to build relationship in a way that is mutually uh, um, uh, upbuilding for for everybody, and I think that's the that's the way those apologies should be. So, and what I've found is that most people, uh, the apologies are helpful in unveiling a reality that people have not really understood so uh, you know uh, and I, I you know I mean it's it, it's a, it's a it's a pretty pretty cool thing you know I, I you know I think uh, it helps people to see realities they didn't understand before Mark uh, Libby's asking a question that I think is um, <clears throat> a, a, a important one for us to consider in the context of our Christian faith and Christian church. As she asks, um, so you've rightly linked power and oppression to principalities of darkness. How do we reckon with or acknowledge the damage that has been done to humanity by colonial Christianity in attempt to save the people they see below them? Right, 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 right. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, that's a really, 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 really good question. And I, you know, and I have to uh, say, uh, so when I, you know, um, I was talking about this um, the other day, uh, the church I grew, grew up in asked me to talk to them about uh, what I was doing, you know, and uh it was a very interesting conversation because uh, uh, they wanted to to know, uh, uh, and and it was uh, you know I I was I was really honest with them and uh, but so <clears throat> um, the. Uh, the, the, the thing that I have found most important and most helpful is uh, the, 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 the gospel of Jesus Christ 
um, has a power that is greater than the intention, foolishness, and evil of the people who proclaim it. So what, what I'm saying is that, um, uh, uh, so, so people will often expect me that to uh, defend the church, you know, uh, they will they will think that I'm in a in a position where I would be defensive about the church or want to defend it, and and I I never you know I never do I never I never am uh, I I I think I know more about the bad stuff the church has done than certainly anybody I've met, and uh, uh, but. Um, I know another side of the story, and that is the way uh, indigenous elders uh, saw the intense evil that uh, churches did, and um, but were absolutely overwhelmed by the beauty of the message they carried with them. And it was so beautiful and so wonderful that they ignored the the sometimes silliness, sometimes hypocrisy, uh, sometimes outright evil of the people who carried it. And I have to say also, uh, there were some people that were so good that they that they they shined like like stars in the night, uh, bright stars in the night. There, you know, not everybody was bad, and you know, there's some people like, uh, you know, there's some uh, uh, non-indigenous people like uh, Hudson Stuck in Alaska. Uh, to this day, um, he inspires me. Uh, in 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 you know. Um, to this day, uh, um, indigenous people in Alaska uh, tell stories about him and what a wonderful person he is. Uh, Dr. Driggs in Alaska, uh, to this day, people tell stories about him and what a wonderful person he is. And so there are, you know, sharp contrasts to uh, uh, to to that. Uh, you know, uh, I, there are other stories, but. Uh, I think that the ultimate story is a twofold. Uh, the amazing, uh, the amazing power of the gospel uh, to uh, overcome. There, there was a a, um, a Guichin, a prophet, um, uh, Albert Tritt, who lived among the uh, um, Nezai Guichin. Um, up towards uh, the uh, the 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 um, um, Arctic coast, and uh, uh, he he famously said, uh, uh, "The way of the white man leads to death; the way of Jesus leads to life." He made a distinction between what the 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 white men said, both the both the, the you know the the, the you know they they encountered the the uh, traders and the trappers and the missionaries uh, and what what uh, they read in the Bible and uh, and so uh, the other thing I would say is uh, 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 when they encountered the Christian message uh, they um, it they it it shaped them. But also, uh, they shaped it in a in a beautiful and wonderful way. And now they had to do it underground. And now that story is coming out because you know it was illegal to to uh, uh, you know uh, uh, they had to hide it from the missionaries and for the from the RCMP uh, because it was illegal uh, to to uh, native. 
spirituality was illegal until the 60s. You know, they got away with it a little bit, but uh, but uh, it was largely hidden. And that story is just coming out now. And uh, and uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing to behold. So that the intelligence, uh, uh, resilience, and uh, um, um, spiritual, uh, uh, I, I, I'm trying to, the, the spiritual, a depth of, of indigenous people, a couple with the, the glorious wonder of the gospel uh, has uh, produced a uh, fruit that I think uh, it's gonna take a while because one thing is they, you know, for a for hundred years, they've had to, to hide it, uh, but, and, and also, and nobody wanted to hear it, um, and I think I think it's going to come out. I think it will amaze people, and uh, and and I think uh, I think uh, colonial Christianity will both be humbled by it and enriched by it, and they will see what the what was the real treasure they had, you know, and they will say, well, you know. We had some things wrong, but we had some things right. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Mark, a question um, from Karen. Um, there are circles in Toronto. I'm for, sorry, I forget the actual name. Are they open to everyone? Uh, circles. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the, I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure, but but what you're referring to, Karen, can you say more? Karen, can you unmute yourself and, and uh, say more about that question, please? Mark, I'm looking for Karen and I can't see her. Um, oh. So maybe what I'll do if I could, if you don't mind, I'll move on to the next question and then um, we'll see maybe, um, Natalie, if you have a chance to find out where Karen is, could you just send her a note and um, ask, and after, after this question, maybe uh, she could fill in the one that she, um, uh, the question she uh -huh. asked. Uh, so two things. One was um, uh, uh, Kathy wrote that it was really helpful. Uh, we must reassert the victory of Christ. I love the quote from St. Francis. Thank you very much. And Diane mm -hmm. Toyson is um, uh, asking a question that uh, I think a lot of us are uh, uh, deeply, increasingly aware of. How many people in the more remote um, indigenous areas consider themselves Christian? Are there um, ways that we can connect, learn, and be supportive? And I think particularly in terms of some of the uh, issues around water and housing is what uh, attracted me out of that question as well. Uh, good. Yeah, good, good. Um, <laughs> I, so this is one of the great ironic things about Canada is that uh, Indigenous people are arguably the most uh, Christianized ethnic group in Canada. I mean, it, it, it's... it's uh, you know, uh, so now the the visible spokespeople for indigenous people, who are largely urban, most of most of them have lived away from uh, uh, the reserves uh, for you know usually for uh, a couple of uh, generations. Uh, they are generally not only. Uh, have not uh, any uh, relationship to Christianity. They are typically hostile to it. Uh, but when you go out to, uh, you know, when you go north, uh, uh, most communities are uh, 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 um, uh, Christian down to their toenails. Uh, and and uh, most of, in, like in the Arctic, uh, most, you know, the largest group is, uh, I, arguably Anglicostal or uh, Pentlican, I guess. Uh, no, I'm, it's hard to 
you know, they're 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 a, a, a very enthusiastic Anglicans, and uh, and and uh, and um, in northern Manitoba, northern Ontario, uh, 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 those areas, uh, uh, a very uh, um, strong uh, uh, strong form of Christianity is is present. Um, uh, you would you would find that uh, Christianity is pretty strong across uh, across those areas. Um, so, uh, and and it, it's it's problematic. So it, so so for instance, um, in <coughs> a Stony Mountain, uh, in which is a, a big prison, uh, you know the the largest uh, group of, of uh, the largest population there is indigenous, uh, and uh, the government uh, only allows uh, uh, traditional uh, indigenous spirituality. But most of these folks uh, come from uh, Christian communities, so it's a it's a it's a real mess. Uh, it, so uh, it, it's. Uh, uh, and and uh, I think again, uh, water is a huge issue, and uh, there are um, you know there a PWRDF is uh, trying to deal with water issues, and uh, you could uh, make a direct uh, 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 donation to that. Again, I think what I said earlier, um, uh, if you know. Uh, uh, if 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 you if uh, if if your church if you're you know if if you if you let uh, your politicians know we don't like that Canada has uh, sub third world conditions uh, uh, you know a place that uh, likes to see itself as the icon of 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 uh, of, of, of uh, clean, clean environment uh, uh, it is has people that uh, uh, you know hundred a hundred plus communities on uh, water boil water advisories. Uh, I, you know this is this is an outrage. Uh, uh, I I think letting politicians know uh, this is uh, uh, we've known for many many years. That uh, uh, that uh, this uh, uh, what it costs to solve this problem, and uh, 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 you know the, the indigenous people have various views on the pipeline, right? Right, but we know that um, uh, what the the government spent to buy the pipeline uh, is about roughly about half. Of what it would cost to solve the water problem in Canada, so it, it, it's uh, uh, it, it's you know what we need is a, a, for Canada to say enough is enough, and uh, so I think that's that's the the way that we could really really help. Uh, you know, uh, it's it's just that Canada is willing to tolerate. Uh, a, a huge portion of its population living in in subhuman conditions. Yeah. Mark, thank you for that. I think um, it's not a quote uh, that is uh, mine, but I can remember the quote that said, "The power of evil is its ability to overwhelm good people into inaction." Um, and I yeah, think we yeah, have to be yeah. careful as Christians not to be overwhelmed into inaction by whatever evils that we're facing, and particularly this one. Um, I'm yeah. grateful to Natalie. She she got in touch with Karen. Karen's Wi-Fi actually dropped, so she's not on the, uh -huh. on the call. But she said, when we have the Indigenous Week at Wycliffe College, um, yep. groups usually go into prayer circles or band circles, um, uh, at yeah, the yeah. Morning, which is a, a big... A big deal in that group, um, and I think she was wondering whether these are the kinds of circles that uh, to which others might be might be or could be invited. 
Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the uh uh yeah, we we have an the, the we have a number of them and they're always open to to folks. The problem would be oops, sorry. Um the problem would be uh uh, uh connecting because they're not they're not um uh, they're they're not uh, always uh, uh, they're not they're they're not uh, always uh, regularly scheduled. That's the that's the issue. Um, so um, it's, it would be impossible to say. Well, yeah, we'll, we'll you know go go there on Tuesday and it'll, it'll happen. But uh, but generally they're open and uh, uh, in fact. Uh, Pretty much all of them have multiple, uh, um, you know, are um, well. I actually all of them pretty much are uh, a mixture of of of, of uh, indigenous and non-indigenous. Yeah. yeah. So th so they're open, and uh, uh, there are meetings that we have that are indigenous exclusively, but. Uh, you know, when we gather around the gospel, uh, we do not. Um, we we like to be uh, everybody. Yeah, yeah. And I should say, all of our our urban area uh, work is, I would say, about uh, uh, sixty percent indigenous, forty percent non. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mark, um, this has been an extraordinary evening for me. I have um, um, learned so much, um, as I actually, as I always do when I have opportunity to hear you uh, hear you speak. And I'm fortunate to be able to do that um, in the context of the House of Bishops as chaplain. Mm. Um, I'm very grateful for uh, for that. Um, I think I'm looking at the um, uh, at the clock, and I I, um, um, I think perhaps we could draw the evening to a conclusion. And and I think it would be very appropriate, uh, Mark, if if um, if you would do that um, by drawing us to a time of prayer uh, for tonight. But sure. I do want to say um, uh, how deeply grateful I am uh, that you accepted the in invitation to come and how um, um, how uh, so how thoughtful and challenging and thought provoking you've been for me personally tonight. And I suspect that may be true for others. So. I'm very grateful that you've kicked off this subject at, at Trinity Streetsville. And it's my hope in the next couple of weeks that we will follow this up uh, with, with a, another uh, evening on uh, systemic racism. And we'd like to do it from um, uh, the point of view of, of some local voices within the congregation. So we'll let you know when those, that date is set up. But Mark, really deeply grateful for your being with us tonight. And if you could close us with, uh, with some prayer, that would be... Uh, Wonderful, thank you. Great, great, great. Okay, let us pray. <clears throat> Almighty God, Gichi Manado, we are so very grateful for your loving presence. Uh, you have been here and you have listened. And you have empowered us both in word and in hearing, uh, not by our goodness, not by our readiness, but by the promise of your son, Jesus, that when two or three are gathered together in his name, uh, you would make sure that he would be present with us uh, through the power of your Holy Spirit. Uh, we pray that what uh, you have given us uh, through him might be fruitful in the Holy Spirit and that it may um, uh, bring healing and reconciliation uh, be between those of us who have been estranged by the evil of systemic racism and the way in which that has um, harmed and defaced 
uh, your image uh, in people uh, across uh, the, the, our collective uh, humanity and, uh, and hurt so many uh, in, in individuals in our collective humanity. We pray that the communion that you have given us in your son, Jesus Christ, may show his glory, his wonder, his love, his power, and that you may feel it. We remember now the many, many, many people who are hurt uh, by this evil. The, the, the young people who are, are hurt by uh, the, the prejudice and hatred, the fear that is directed towards them, uh, the many young people who suffer in jail, and the children who suffer in poverty. We pray that you would uh, do something great in this country of ours that we love and adore, in this land that we love and adore, and that you would help us to be a part of that healing. We are thankful for the baptism of your son, Jesus. And we believe in the way in which he touched those waters, that that holy river is now flowing from the waters of the Jordan out through the nations, and that wherever it goes, uh, new life is formed and that there are leaves that are for the healing of the nations. Let there be healing, let there be new life, and let all of it be to your glory and the honor of your name. We pray blessing upon everybody here, their families, their loved ones, and we thank you and bless you. Ode Ishma Kasumi, Jesus the Benjigate. Amen.